Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of Virtual Consult, and thank you for taking the time to be here. My name is Ray Coulomb. I'm the Managing Director of Security Specifiers, and we are co-hosting this day today with the Security Industry Association, affectionately known as SIA. And with us from SIA uh, to say hello is Jeff Cole. Say hi, Jeff. Hi, Ray, and, and good morning or good afternoon, I guess, depending on which coast you're on. Uh, to everyone here, glad to support this event and uh, looking forward to today's content. Absolutely. And uh, C is responsible for the, uh, the Zoom platform and all the back office uh, uh, string pulling and everything. So, Jeff, thank you guys for that. Um, also, our event sponsors for Virtual Consult are Altronics, Acre, Intel, Linell S2, and Salient Systems, all consist consistently strong supporters of our consult event, both live and now virtual. As mentioned yesterday, for those who are here, the event has been approved by both Bixi and As Is For Credits. Uh, first of all, if you sent me a note yesterday asking for certificates, you do not need to send one today. We'll simply look at the attendee list. For those of you who are new today, for Bixi, if you attend all three sessions, you receive three CECs. With Bixi, it's an all or nothing arrangement. With as is, you'll get credit for one CPE for each session you attend. Simply send a request to me, ray at securityspecifiers.com. Give me a couple, three days to get through all the requests that we have because we've got a lot of them and I'll send a certificate back to you. Please make sure you're logged in, not as anonymous, but under your own name, because I can't make out a certificate to anonymous. We have a great topic today, uh, dealing with the topic of OSDP, and it is sponsored by Cypress Integration Solutions. So thank you, Paul Ahern, for that. Mm -hmm. And the panel that we have is a very strong panel. Uh, the moderator, Rodney Thayer, I've known Rodney for a long time, is actually the one who put OSDP on my own radar screen and prompted me to start dealing with this topic at our consult events. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and go over to Rodney. And Rodney, I'm going to ask you to share yours and introduce your panel and then deal with the topic today. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you, Ray. Um, so today we're going to talk about OSDP and uh, thank you to Cyprus. Um, so the panelists. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm I'm uh, Rodney Thayer. I'm a convergence engineer. In other words, I deal with networking and physical security things together. Uh, I'm an uh, independent consultant. My consulting company is Smithy Solutions. Uh, we have with us uh, several panelists. Um, I'll go through the, the absentees also here. So first of all, Paul Ahern, uh, who's the president and CEO of Cypress Integration Solutions. So he's our he's our token manufacturer here. Um, Joe Gittens, who's been the Security Industry Association. Joe, Joe has the tough job of herding all the cats uh, around the standards process. Uh, so glad you're with us, Joe. Um, Brian Coulomb, who is with uh, Ross and Berezini. Is that the way you say it? Um, That's right. So from the, from the security specifiers community, uh, glad to have you with us. John Nemirovsky will join us if he can. He had a flight delay this morning. So he's uh, running through airports right now, we hope. Um, so he, he, uh, he may uh, step in here. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to join us. Uh, so, okay. So this is the, the pictures from John. It's his fault. Um, so it's, it's time to start looking at OSDP uh, as opposed to some of the older things, uh, weekend and, and some of the older <coughs> technologies people are using. Uh, somebody pointed out to me, uh, Paul, was, uh, I found something on uh, LinkedIn this morning. I, I, I clipped out a piece of the quote, which was, when you discover you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount. Um, so if you're using Weekend and, and you've identified the, all the issues around that, you know, maybe it's time to move on. So the format, the panel, we got six sections we're going to talk about uh, um, a little over here in the intro. Um, so, you know, no more than eight minutes on each. Um, we're going to show some talking points for the panel to talk about, and uh, we'll get their opinions on things. And I'm hoping we can have some audience, pers audience participation um, if uh, the technology all uh, supports us doing that. First topic. Uh, so uh, does, how did we describe OSDP? Um, so wh what's the short version? Uh, what's the elevator pitch? Uh, who, who wants to take this? Uh, 
I was going to pick on Paul or John, but John's not here. So Paul, can you handle that? What's the elevator pitch? Give, give me OS, what, describe OSDP in two sentences. I start my elevator pitch off with a question is, is are we selling security or are we selling convenience? You know, when I look back at Weekend, I see it as a convenience way of getting convenient way of getting in, but it's not secure. So my elevator pitch is, can you do both? And I said, yes, with OSDP. Sounds like a good, and anybody else got any, uh, want, want to try to chime in on that? Just to add on OSDP, is, it's a Wigan replacement. It's a bi-directional communication and that bi-directionality gives it um, um, multiple uh, advancements over Weekend, including security, ease of use. Um, and I, I think that you could do uh, you can get a lot of convenience, as Paul mentioned, um, but it's not a convenience or security. You can get security with some convenient factors with that bi bidirectionality. Yeah, Brian. And, and, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I might add just one last piece of it, which is that this is not a bleeding edge technology. It's already widely supported by manufacturers across the industry. So there's no reason not to be looking at it. Very good. So how, how do we talk about OSDP in the design process? Uh, you know, where customer wants to do a new building, they're, they're rebuilding everything because of, uh, you know, current conditions or whatever. Uh, how, how do you end up bringing up OSDP in the, in the design process? Brian, where do, where do you start? Yeah, so I guess I would preface my remarks just by saying that if, if you're working with a client and you're advocating you know, for certain things as part of your design, if you're not having the conversation about OSDP, then you're truly doing your client a disservice. I mean, it is a tectonic shift um, in the way that it is now a secure protocol versus something that is just wide open, one-way communication, um, you know, using WeGAN at this point is equivalent to counseling your clients to leave their default passwords on all of their, their networking equipment. Um, you know, there's, there's a great video out there that is published by SIA where, you know, it's, it's shown that you can, you can hack this protocol, WeGAN protocol in, in 90 seconds with, you know, a basic $20 tool that you can buy online. So when I'm talking to clients about new builds in particular, um, acknowledging that, you know, some retrofit designs have, you know, their own challenges, but for a, a brand new facility, you know, basically giving them the elevator pitch on OSDP. I mean, it shouldn't take more than that. It's a secure protocol. Um, it's bi-directional. So a lot of the you know, frustrations that end users have with having to go out to the field to, you know, change the programming on car readers or, or anything like that can now be done from a centralized location. There's really no drawback to it. It's, it's not, you know, doubling the cost of a project. So, I mean, making those basic points to a client is usually enough to get them there. Um, the only times that I've had, you know, any sort of pushback is when there's sort of deeply embedded standards within that client's organization. Um, and even then, I think it's, it's still worth making a hard pitch for it. Uh, the, the idea of deeply embedded standards and security uh, in the same thought is kind of, kind of an interesting uh, point there. Um, how do we specify it? How do we, uh, does it go in a CSI spec? Is there a Bixie standard we should be quoting? Uh, uh, we have an IEC standard for the, for the protocol itself, but in, this, in the design process, how, how are we supposed, to, how are security specifiers supposed to be specifying this? So, so what I've done is it's in my division 28 spec, right? I, I specifically call out that the wiring for those card readers is to be OSDP. The, the cabling that I'm showing in my specs and on my drawings is, is OSDP compliant cabling. Um, that, that's how at least I'm including it in my own designs. Paul, how do, how do we make sure that when, we, when he draws the wires on there correctly, that they bother to buy OSDP components and not Wigan readers? Not that we've ever seen integrators ship Wigan readers to an OSDP site. That's never happened, of course. <laughs> um, but uh, Paul, how do, how, do we, uh, how do we make sure they specify the parts right? Well, uh, and going back to that, we've, we've seen the same thing. We, we've getting phone calls already from integrators calling up and saying, hey, look, we bought these devices and we're trying to get them to hook up. He says, well, what are you hooking up to? Well, we're hooking up to the D1 and the D0. And he said, well, that's a Wigan connection. And they said, Oh, no, no, we've got OSDP readers. He says we were told they could just wire right up to the two wires. So a lot of it's happening in that when the uh, security integrators are out looking and dealing with their distributors for their purchases and their acquisitions, um, there's still a lot of education that's needed, especially in the distributor network, where people are asking for card readers 
And unfortunately, they're just giving them what they used to give them. They're not asking the questions about what protocol do you want? So there's, there's a need for education there. So these are the same people are gonna give you the same gasoline credit card for the new Tesla that you had for your old car because everything always works the same. Or they're pulling up to the gas pump, same thing. Yes, right, Tesla, right. So. so there was a question that came in. I'm trying to watch the chat, a little challenge here. A uh, comment about there, there are people out there who are, are not comfortable with the conversion. Let me just look at the text again. Come on, zoom. The dead horse theory. Yes, right. Um, yeah, a comment about uh, um, people are not yet comfortable with the conversion process. Uh, so yeah, if you have an existing site, um, they're going to have to convert some of their equipment. So to your point, you know, Paul's point, um, uh, there, you know, there may be more wiring and you know things you got to change. You can't just expect the same old stuff. It's not like using the same Phillips head screws you used last time. All right, kind of moving on. Come on, UI, move on. There we go. Uh, advantages. We talked about some of this a little bit already. Um, there's benefits in access control. And I, you know, on this, I put a bunch of things here. So security is one of them is separate. Uh, what's the benefit to the access control solution? What, what do you get out of that for, uh, what's OSTP help there? I'm thinking things like uh, support other card formats, um, new devices, new kinds of devices. What do you think? Well, I, my first suggestion or my first comment would be, is that right now everybody's focusing on card readers and weekend. But if you read the OSTP spec, it goes way beyond just card readers and weekend. So if you put the infrastructure in to support OSDP with your readers, there's no reason that you can't support every peripheral device out there. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow, you know, basically opening up, opening up the opportunities for every known type of device or peripheral device could eventually just be thrown on that same communications cable and not having to wire everything separately, but it gives the end users and the integrators as people adopt OSDP, the option for a much bigger uh, toolbox, much bigger shopping basket of things they can provide to their customers. All right, cool. Um, infrastructure management. <coughs> um, we talk about this when we do, uh, with, with OSDP, we can do firmware updates and push config files and change keys and all sorts of things because you, it's bi-directional, as we said. Um, so uh, Brian, do you see people uh, interested in that, the fact their infrastructure management uh, you know, they've got new benefits. Absolutely. And I think that's a major selling point, right? I mean, if you, if you want to do a firm update, firmware update to your card readers or change an encryption key or something along those lines, and you've got hundreds of card readers, I mean, in the weekend days, you were going to every single card reader. Um, and, and maybe that takes days to get that done. Whereas in, a, in an OSDP world, you can do that from a centralized location. You can push those updates out. And, and basically do them all at once. So I think, you know, that's a huge infrastructure benefit. And, you know, possibly that means that an end user can, you know, tackle minor tasks themselves versus having to, you know, roll a service call. Uh, and, and, if I just, and if I might just add too, um, it's interesting how in, a, in the access control world compared to the rest of the security world, we're pretty much the only side of the security business that doesn't supervise their end devices. I mean, when you consider weekend readers, there's no supervision. If the reader's dead, you don't find out until the CEO or SVP shows up at the front door to try to get in and all of a sudden the card reader doesn't work. Preferably it's Saturday morning, yes, also. Uh, yeah. there, was a, there was a question that came in about uh, cabling. Um, when Can you use existing cabling with OSDP? Uh, so the, um, let's see. Paul, you want to talk? You, you want to talk about that, or shall I? Uh, normally, well, I would pick on John about this. Um, well, there's there's a can and there's a should. Um, we've we see people using existing wiring and it's working. Should you use it? Is the other question. Um, again, a lot of the weekend wire was just a two conductor, and we've seen people use those two conductors because they're only using that 500 feet, and we don't see a problem with it. But being that OSTP can push a lot further than 500 feet. You could use it, it may work, but I wouldn't use it. Okay, yeah. Uh, some other comments coming in. Um, so let's see, so somebody pointed out that Wigan's only one way, so there's all sorts of uh, low level uh, interference possibilities, electromagnetic interference and other things. And because OSTP is a, a full on protocol, both sides are communicating, they're both having, a, uh, they're both exchanging messages 
So we really have a, a mechanism there. If there were an issue with the communications, you'd know it because the, the panel would know that it was doing retries or getting errors coming out of the reader. Uh, so that's sort of you know, addressing that. Um, somebody asked what cabling is going to use for OSDP. There is, in fact, a spec for RS-45 cabling. Uh, and so you can you know, specify RS-45 cabling and, and there, people have started to label it OSDP. Uh, a few vendors are doing that. Um, and so that's it, the, the thing about 45 is that there's certain characteristics about um, the uh, capacitance of the cable because they don't want signals reflecting. Uh, so there's, that's what the certification process is about. And with OSDP, it's a protocol. So you need two wires for the messages for the two wire RS-45. Um, plus you need to power the device, of course. So unlike Weekend, where you needed, you know, a wire for the LED, this is, this is the newbie question is like, calm down. It's okay. There's no LED wire coming out of the back of your OSDP reader. It doesn't work that way. It's a command. Um, so it's two wires. You don't need the, the multi-conductor cable you need with the, in the Weekend world. And, and Rodney, you can, you can daisy chain readers, right? Cause it's, yeah. it's RS-45 and, and maybe that isn't a huge benefit, but if you've got multiple card readers at one opening, for instance, that, that might be of some benefit and, you know, create some efficiencies on the cabling side. Yeah. We are seeing people who want to use the efficiencies of multi-drop. Uh, other people think that's more complicated or, or a security issue. So uh, multiple ways of getting used. Um, because of that protocol is you could push push text, you could do prompts, you could do colors. Um, so just going through customer benefits there. Uh, I don't, um, you know, Ronnie talks about some of his customers all the time that are very specific about colors on their readers and, and things like that. And right. it comes directly from this, the protocol. Right. And, and so uh, to Paul's point, you can, uh, you can run multiple kinds of devices. So the component that's unlocking the door can be on the same RS-45 run. Uh, so that can eliminate number that and lower the number of cables you have to go to to physically near the door. Da, 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 scrolling, scrolling. Um, yeah, yeah, people are talking about cables here. Um, and there's there there are procedures out there for various uh, 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 vendors. You know, somebody mentioned mentioned secure. There's lots of vendors out there who have a you know established procedures for doing this. Um, one of the things John was sharing earlier. Uh, he's got a couple of sites that have done major upgrades recently and gone through thousands of new panels on uh, systems like uh, um, Honeywell and, and I believe Genetech was the other one. Uh, so the vendors are out there supporting it. Hey, hey Paul, I, I wanted to respond to something that you said yeah. about, you know, if you had legacy cabling out there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use it for, for OSDP. In my mind, there's always been a, a cost benefit there where if I have wiring that's, that's legacy, but it works with OSDP, that would still be my preference over you know, reusing it and, and putting out a Wigan reader. Did I understand you right there? Yes. Yeah, the, the challenge that we've seen so far is that when people are just doing their Wigan only over that 500 feet, they're fine. I think if they start adding more components and ex expect to be able to use that existing and we've got people out there we've seen with old telephone 28 gauge wire that they were riding Wigand over. So none of it's going to meet any 485 spec, but it seems to work for short runs. That's all we're seeing. Hmm. Yeah. And um, there are tests, there is our test devices that can certify a cable. So if I was specifying a place where I had to you know, try very hard to use the old cabling, um, I'd wish the, I wish the project process would bother to specify that a, a certification device gets used, you know, which means somebody has to buy the $1,000 widget and we have to actually allocate the time for that uh, in the project. Uh, but there are ways to go out and check your cable uh, if you really feel you need to use the existing cable. Um, so vendor supply chain benefits. I, I put this one in. I, I was meaning things like uh, supply chain diversity. So you know, what if you need to go with multiple reader vendors? You know, what if your reader vendors in a part of the world that went into complete lockdown and you can't get parts from somebody? Uh, you know, it'd be really nice if you had another reader vendor you could work with. So are you seeing the diversity angle of the multi having, being able to have multiple vendors? Do you, do you see people interested in that? Um, Brian, is that something you've heard people caring about? Um, not in my experience, I haven't. But, um, you know, moving forward, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that, that you know, came up more frequently. But, but as of right now, that has not come up. <laughs> Um, so there's some more comments coming in. Somebody's asking about IP. Uh, so, you know, Joe, too, we, you know, we've got OSTP over TCP is, um, is a work in progress. Is that the right way to describe it? But, but substantially worked on and also OSTP over TLS. 
Yeah, yeah, OSCP over uh, TLS is is a is an active prof profile within the OSCP working group. Um, so that we've we've done a profile as how that would work, um, and and you know some do's and don'ts of of doing OSDP uh, um, over IP. So obviously you don't want it on the um, at at the door and, and other other types of uh, extensions to that. So that's 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 an active. Um, we get that question a lot, and, and it is an active uh, uh, project. In, in the OSDP working group that we hope to have more fleshed out over the next, the, the upcoming year or so. Uh, cool. All right. So uh, we talked about kind of customer fantasies. So I'm going to you know, keep things moving on here. Uh, alternatives. So if, you know, we talk about using OSTP as a, a you know, next generation standard, et cetera. Are, what are the alternatives? Is this the only, is this the only game in town? Uh, you know, we, we, we suggest moving away from Weekend and some of the other uh, legacy protocols. What about Ethernet? What about wireless? Um, what about all those vendors running around with proprietary 45? Are, are, is OSDP better than that stuff? Is it different? Uh, how does that fit in? What about, what about OSDP versus, versus uh, devices with Ethernet in them? Uh, Paul, what do you see with, in terms of what people want to buy um, for equipment? Uh, we're seeing people buying everything. Uh, we're seeing people that are, you know, pushing to get, especially with the biometrics, because they're sending more data back and forth with templates. So we're seeing Ethernet there. Uh, and then we're seeing OSDP put on top of it. So going back to the TLS OSDP, that getting that out to the market would allow them to use that same OSDP or that same uh, TCP IP connection to be able to manage all of that information, including all the templates like for bio. So we're seeing it all. What about the the uh, using a standard versus using proprietary forty five? What do we, what what what's our advice on, on that, Joe? Joe, how do we how do we talk about the standards versus non standards thing? Any sort of guidance from the the C of standards world? Well, it's it's been beating my head ever since uh, you know uh, becoming director of standard that uh, uh, standard the standard using this open standard approach is better than proprietary. It gives you it gives you um, a choice, and it goes back to that you know that that vendor supply chain ecosystem where uh, you're never locked into a, a, a system um, uh, because it does, does uh, you know, one thing. Um, so uh, uh, use, we, we're see as an anti-accredited um, standards development organization. Uh, the process we, we, we do to, uh, to modify the standard and, and, and make it better and, 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 and um, advance it is based off of standards. And uh, we, the, the, the good thing about that is we get buy-in from the entire OSCB community. Um, so it's, 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 things aren't, aren't done unilaterally. So you have that diversity of vendors um, that, are, that are kind of doing things the same way. So whenever, whenever possible, choose the standards approach. Yeah, I would, I would uh, tend to go along with that. And uh, there's lots of uh, negative sides to using a proprietary uh, technology. You can get a lot of uh, issues, security issues, compatibility issues. Well, and Legacy. if I could just add in very quickly, yeah. if, if you take a look at history for the last 20 or 25 years, the companies that had proprietary 485 that aren't around any longer and people are stuck with incompatible devices, um, and most manufacturers have stepped to the plate to give people options, but there was some time in between where people were stuck and had nothing to supply. If, if something were to die, you had nothing to replace it with. There was a uh, question came in about the uh, how how sensitive is the the low capacitance requirement in the wire, um, so the, the this is uh, laws of physics around RS forty five electronics. Uh, so if you are running a very high speed link over a long distance, so like as Paul pointed out, like biometrics, lots of templates, for example, and you are running over thousands of feet, uh, forty five can go up to four thousand feet. So if you're using that combination, you probably want the very good cable. Um, the shorter distances you can get away with more, uh, you know, it's not so hard to meet the spec because the, the signal's not going to bounce. Basically, the signal bounces off the end of the wire and it causes interference. And you get less of that effect with shorter, decent cables. So, you know, your 28 gauge phone wire probably is pretty bad. Um, and, uh, but but uh, reasonably clean Wigan wire that was in the, you know, already in the ceiling, you, you may well be able to do that. And these test devices ch measure that. That's the other thing about that. So if you have a big enough job that a $1,000 tool isn't a big deal, then you'll just get the tool. 
Uh, great, great answer, Ronnie. And what I'm noticing from a lot of these questions um, uh, about the infrastructure and cabling and things like that, um, I just wanted to, to uh, if you go to this, the CA website on, on the OSDP bootcamp, there are three videos that really go in depth on these things um, in, in particular. So if you want answers to those questions or people within the ecosystem that you're working with talking about OSDP, you can direct them there. Um, they're, they're broken down into uh, in, in, into different categories. So, uh, you know, questions about the spec, questions about um, implementation implementation, questions about maintenance, and um, uh, we, they're about 45 minutes each. So you can find um, the answers to a lot of these infrastructure type questions there. Thanks, Joe, for pointing that out. I think, I think Rodney, this is a good uh, stepping stone to your next topic and your next one where we talk about a plan, so. <laughs> yeah, so so interoperability. So that, you know, people ask about the interoperability between devices. So, so first of all, sir, you know, what, why is it supposed to work? That's the what's the plan thing. And I had three or four of the items here. Uh, first thing I want to do is point out that there is a, a an OSTP verified process. I um, stole some artwork from from Joe's slide deck here. Uh, so um, let me just explain this a little bit. So there's a program. We're going to ask Joe about it in a minute. Uh, to give you an example, there is a logo. Uh, I didn't know Joe would have it on his background, but there is a verified logo. You can look for the logo now. <laughs> Um, and they're doing the appropriate process. So that's intellectual property protected. And there's a website with a list of approved products. And I grabbed a copy of the table out of the artwork. Um, you know, there's more vendors in process now. Uh, but Joe, could you talk about the, the OSTB verified process a little bit? Yeah, really. One, one of the one of the, uh, the questions we kept getting is how do you know um, if, if people are doing OSDP, if people are doing OSDP the right way, um, your vendors are doing OSDP the right way. Uh, so we came up with a, a, a very lightweight program um, that um, allows uh, manufacturers to submit products to be tested within a lab. Um, uh, it's, it's a consultative process, and we, we create a list on the CIA website um, that 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 tells you whether or not they are they're, they're, they conform to um, the latest version of OSDP, and not only that, but what, what profile. So whether it's a basic reader, um, so present a card, read it, um, and a weekend replacement, uh, whether they, they, they implement secure channel, we were seeing that a lot of, a lot of uh, companies were saying they do OSDP, but not necessarily um, the secure elements of OSDP. Uh, so that's a big deal if you're, look, if you're, if you're you know, uh, if you're specifying secure um, a secure uh, solution, um, if it could handle smart cards, so PIV cards, um, uh, you know, things for the FICAM process, and whether it handles the biometric uh, messages. So these are lab tested and, and really uh, goes through what the um, what the company claims and whether or not it works the way that uh, it, it's intended to work. Uh, so this this list, as, as Ronnie pointed out, there's um, there's there's three um, vendors on the list right now. Uh, it, look out within the next uh, two weeks, there should be a, another batch. And um, these are these are uh, names that that many of you guys all know um, and and would 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 love to see on this type of list. Uh, so so you can have that vendor diversity. Whoops. Backwards, come on, there we go. And Joe, that, that list lives online where it's easily accessible? Yeah, it's a, um, if you go to the CA website, if you go to standards, um, it says OSDP verified, if you hover over it, um, and that leads you directly to that list. I think as a specifier, one of the things, I mean, I, I only recently became aware of this program, but I can absolutely see including that in my own specifications, uh, my open specifications where I'm not, you know, specking a specific part to, to say that you know the the card reader needs to be OSDP verified. Yeah, that was that we, we got those questions a lot from the, the specifier community, the consultant community, and and it, it's really uh, designed to help the entire ecosystem. It's help scientists help this this community that we're talking to right now, but also it lets manufacturers make sure that they're differentiated and they and they and they um what they they're. they're their claim, if you're doing things the right way, you don't have the manufacturers that are, that are doing things differently or their way or proprietary OSDP. Um, it, it's, everything's done the same way. Mm -hmm. So this kind of talked about the, the how is it measured uh, question, um, but there, just to, to a, something Joe said, which is very, very important for the process. If you, if you find you're pushing vendors into doing this is uh, it's meant to be a, a reasonable, lightweight, consultative process. So this is it's not a secret test with 8,000 questions that you never get to figure out if you got it right or not. Uh, it's a, there's a, a known set of tests which is published and there's a, a process where, the, uh, where they're exercised and we gather the output, for, uh, the, the results of that. And so the, the, uh, to get onto the, the, the little table in the website, uh, there's a, 
uh, a, sort of a QA kind of a process behind it. So uh, there are specific measurements. So if uh, to, to go on to the next point, you know, what do we do if it fails? So, uh, you know, the, the verify process is supposed to have enough data backing it up. So if somebody wanted to wonder if some things were measured, uh, there is a piece for that. Uh, Brian, Brian, what happens in the field if it fails? If you, if you specify, I've never seen this happen with a consultant, right? Um, they specified this, that, and the other thing. It all looks wonderful on paper. It worked great and back in the conference room when they staged it. And then when we went out to the customer site, it didn't actually quite work. So what, what do we do? What do we happens if it, what happens if it fails? What are we going to do in those situations? How, how do we, starting with the specifiers, you know, because somebody's going to go back to the specifier about an issue. Where, where do we go with that? Yeah, so I mean, if if the if the reader itself uh, or the panel or wasn't specified properly, then then certainly I've got some explaining to do, right? As to why it was specified a certain way, and I think you know, going back to Joe's point uh, about having the verified program, um, you know, I think it gives me a level of comfort when I'm creating a specification if something's been verified that it's gone through some level of rigorous testing where you know I've got a backstop um, if if for some reason, you know, what was specified ends up ultimately not working. Um, beyond that, I think it's it's really a partnership with the integrator to figure out, you know, what went wrong, um, you know, what the issues are and and how those can be corrected. Um, I think with, with most projects, there's, you know, nothing ever goes exactly as designed. And so it's, it's really, um, it should be a, a cooperative process between, you know, the consultant and the integrator and to some extent, the manufacturers, if, if something doesn't conform to spec or if it was, um, you know, uh, not correct. And, and, you know, what was on the cut sheet, for example, then, then really it's, it's a, a three-way process at that point. So you, you do see it that the integrator is supposed to take some sort of active role in resolving things. Hey, you know, I, I think the, the better integrators that I've had the, the fortune to work with over the years, when something fails, it, it, it should be a partnership. Um, when those solutions to those failures are cooperative, then I think everyone looks a whole lot better. And, you know, certainly I think it helps educate the consultants on how to design something better the next time. And it also helps, you know, the, the, uh, the integrator look good in the, in the specifier's mind. And I'm more likely to recommend them on future projects. I think it's, it's one of those things where if we can be cooperative about fixing problems then then everyone walks away with a better experience and, and better setup for the future. So you try to make sure you work with integrators who can at least spell OSDP. <laughs> Roddy? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, Jim Elder asked a relevant question here at this point in the discussion. Are panels OSDP verified? Sorry, I missed that. Um, yeah, so uh, Paul, you take a shot at that first. I can't answer that question. That's, that's, a, that's a joke question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass so, the torch over to which, which panels are in fact Oh, are they in general? I thought was the question. Yes, panels. Panels are, are um, as they're, they're referred to in the spec, ACUs, access control units, um, are part. They are. Um, they are specified. They are OSDP verified. There is a process for them. Um, there are currently uh, four ACUs within the pipeline right now. Um, so that that section will be beefed up um, if, if all goes well. Uh, with it, like I said, within the next uh, two to three weeks. Um, uh, let, let me give give it a month. They, they're in the lab right now, um, and uh, and ACUs are a little bit more difficult to verify because of all the other um, the the activities that that the panel controls, the ACU controls. Uh, but yes, there is a process for both uh, peripheral devices and ACUs. There's another question that came in about uh, uh, supervised in, um, input on um, through OSTP uh, from Rick Foki uh, of uh, Software House. So the the OSTP working group is looking at um, ex uh, enhancing the spec. There's a there's a process right now. I'm I'm helping Joe edit it. I, you know, let, let me get my work speech and then you can fix it. What I said, Joe. Um, so there's a there's an update to the there's an IEC standard published now. You can buy it online. Uh, there's a SIA update coming out very soon, which is uh, just editing fixes to errata to that. Um, and then there's a SIA process to do a next generation of the spec, which I think is going to get called 2.2.1. Um, and that has a queue of things that people have asked for. An example is more enhanced LED color capabilities. Another example is the topic that Rick brought up, which is that uh, with uh, the input from OSTP, it doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, it does not in the spec right now let you do, uh, 
completely look at a supervised input so they know the difference between uh, shorted and opened and grounded and working and all those things. Uh, so that's an example of a, of a work item that's in process, that's in the to-do list, I think, Joe, uh, <laughs> um, to address that. So that's supposed to come out in 221. And uh, what's, you know, I, he's kind of asking the time frame for 221 also, Joe. Uh, so two 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 one, I would say, is uh, is would be released in Q two twenty twenty one. Uh, two point two uh, will be released uh, in I'd say in about a month's time. Um, we're we're final, like Rodney and I are finalizing um, the the last minute kind of uh, tables and, and 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 messages and errata that we found from the IEC version. I just did want to um, address a question that was said. There was at least two versions of OSDP that. I, I kind of want to move away from that. There are so you, you've you've heard probably heard of the past. You know, uh, we do OSDP one or we do OSDP two. That's not a thing. Um, there's there's the current version that's available, which is OSDP two point one seven, um, and then that is quickly going to be released. Re be replaced by OSCP 2.2, which is a mirror version of the IEC standard. Those are, so um, if you're specifying or, or consulting, those are the, the numbers that you should be using, um, you know, 2.17 or 2.2 or the IEC spec. Um, so th those are, those are the, 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 the versions and 2.17 is about to be really for the lack of a better word, deprecated because 2.2 is going to replace that. Everything that's verified is verified to that 2.2 version um, or the IEC version, which is a mirror document. So I, I might have uh, you know, made that as clear as mud, but OSDP 2 and uh, version 2 and OSDP version 1 are not a thing. And th that gets used a ton of, uh, a lot. There's a... Just to add to that, there actually were some earlier versions of the in the OSDP version two process. So, I run into vendors who ran two one six and two one five, and you know we're all trying to run the current stuff now. And so, but that's a standard IoT cybersecurity et cetera kind of thing. We should all be using the current generation of, of whatever technology we're using. Uh, somebody had a question about uh, line termination resistors. Uh, the um, the business about whether you need to uh, terminating resistor and whether your cable's good enough, those are kind of intertwined questions. And uh, various vendors have different uh, guidance they will give you on how to do line termination resistors. But the, the hardware vendors usually do that. You uh, will give you some, some suggestion. Uh, mostly what I see is that if you have a long link or it's high speed, you should make sure the terminating resistor configuration is, is uh, carefully addressed uh, with shorter cables and, and, um, simple configurations, 9,600 baud, which is the, the default speed. Uh, you can get away with not adding resistor in my experience, but if you're going to high speed or longer distances or multi-drop. Um, and I'm looking at the question stream here. I'm not, I think we got everything covered. Uh, okay, um, migration strategies. So uh, how do you migrate to OSDP? Uh, Let's see, start with you, Paul. Do I need a forklift? Do I need to pull the whole thing? No. Is it a million dollars for the first reader? No, uh, and, and what we're suggesting, and we're hearing others suggest is, is start with your perimeter where you're most vulnerable. So if you're gonna go to OSDP, don't start with a panel. And I hate to say that for the panel manufacturers, but start with the readers, because that's where you're most vulnerable and then get yourself back. And then, you know, uh, there are migration tools to allow you to do this in a step-by-step -step process. So it doesn't, you don't have to go through a rip and replace. So you can also, there are adapter devices from various vendors, including Cypress that, that you could, you could uh, cause there to be an OSDP connection to the reader without having to actually change the panel. And then the other thing is lots of panel vendors have been doing OSDP for a while. So you can quite often just ask them to switch on OSDP on just one port for just one reader um, or change out just one panel uh, so that you can do this gently. Uh, and, uh, you know, presuming, you know, use all the you know, the tools that are, you know, verified and all that. Uh, so, uh, Brian, you have any, any comments from and doing, do, you know, when, when I think of specifying, I, you know, often I'm running into people talking about fresh construction and not, not upgrades, but, you know, how do you look at that as a specifier, the migration questions? Well, I think a lot of it goes back to the infrastructure that we talked about before, right? Um, you know, it could be a forklift if you've got long cable runs and the, those cable runs aren't supportive of OSDP. So I think 
Paul's point is, is very well taken about, you know, start with your more vulnerable locations that may be out at the perimeter, but it's likely that a lot of those locations might have the longest cable runs as well. So I think getting out in the field and, and testing those cables is, is got to be a key part of the process to understand, you know, can we even do it without, you know, ripping, replacing cabling? Um, and then, you know, certainly I think a lot of those, um, a lot of those migration projects or retrofit, retrofit projects. I mean, I know that OSDP has been supported by panels for a while, but I, you know, some of those panels might be 15, 20 years old. So you might be in a position where you need to rip and replace panels if you want to, if you want to migrate to OSDP. So I think, you know, certainly depending on what's out there, how old the, the existing installation is, it could be a forklift in some cases. Um, but you know, if you're already replacing panels cause they're end of life, then, I think you have to at least have the conversation and, you know, I would even suggest that, you know, you, you put in an installation, which is OSDP compatible. And if you have wiring that you're not replacing day one, well, you know, make sure at least your panels and your software are supportive of, OS, of OSDP. So in the future, as you maybe get to replace some of those cable runs, the rest of your system's ready to go. Rodney, uh, a couple of things before you move on. I'm just watching the, uh, the, the chat window here. Uh, a number of comments came in regarding version one versus version two. Uh, different manufacturers, uh, you, you've got to specify, are you using one or are you using two? I know you and, and Joe addressed it earlier, but how about that when somebody is selecting that and they're forced to choose between version one and version two? Um, and uh, the other question that I, I'll queue up to you probably for, uh, for Paul, I'm guessing, is uh, are there readers that are dual function, both, uh, both uh, WIGAN as well as, um, or PROX, as well as OSDP? So I can take the first one. The, the, the reason why we want to um, change that vernacular from version one to version two is, is through this OSDP verified program. We should be specifying a, a verified profile. Um, so, uh, a lot, uh, from, from what I understand when people say version one, version two, the difference is that secure channel. I, I think that that's what, what, what folks mean when they are, um, when they're talking about version one, version two, uh, but there are different intricate, intricate, uh, intricacies involved in that. So making through this verified program, you, you can specify OSC verified and the profile. I do understand that there's only, um, you know, there's only, uh, three manufacturers on the list right now, but, Trust me, by the end of the year, there's going to be, this is going to be an, an, an actual, like, super usable list um, for a lot of the, the, the vendors that, um, that the folks deal with. And uh, you, would, you would start to bear, uh, specify on the profile. So if you're using in 2020 a product which uh, in 2020 is shipping with OSTP version 1 support, that implies it's got some very old technology inside it. Uh, so, so anything with where you're talking about new equipment, I would, I would be worried in general if they were trying to specify OSDP-1. Uh, if you've got existing equipment that had OSDP-1 in it the day it was installed, you know, 27 years ago, then fine. Uh, but that means you've got really old equipment. Uh, so again, you might want to consider uh, changing that. So, you know, that when I hear the one versus two conversation, uh, my immediate reaction is, why are we in a place where we're even talking about one? How did, we, what, what constraint has put that you know, has been put on that and really would prefer it not be that's what the vendor is shipping today. I really would prefer not to hear they're shipping OSDP one today and that be a, an active choice. Um, so let's see, we did that slide. Uh, device management. And so, in terms of, in terms yeah. of the readers that could go, um, uh, that could support, uh, prox and OSTP. Uh, that's not a pro that's not a protocol. I think that's a, that's a, it's not a protocol. Um, you know, uh, question. Uh, there are readers that, that can support both um, in, in different modes. A lot of times it's a jumper. Um, and I guess Rodney could, could clarify that a little bit more. Yeah. And it's, so a jumper or a, um, different pins on the connector. Uh, there's even some readers that are, are auto switchable between the two um, for various reasons. Um, but yeah, that's not, that's not a protocol thing. And it doesn't, uh, it, it, Readers being switched will be nice for migration purposes, but uh, you don't get any of the, if, you, if the other one is weakened, you're still stuck with the unidirectional protocol with no security. Uh, so that, you know, but you know, if you're trying to do migration, that's useful. There are readers in the field that people have uh, been shipping for a while that can be upgraded to OSTP. So that, that off, or can be switched into OSTP mode. 
So you often see that. Uh, device management, uh, the new topic here. Um, so what, what do customers want? What, what do they want for device management? Or what are they looking for? Uh, this is, you know, sorry, John's not here. So the, the old school version of this is, you know, are we gonna starve the integrators because they can't charge money for a human to walk up to every single reader and touch it when they wanna upgrade it? Uh, you know, so, so what are the customers looking for for device management? Uh, what, are you, what are you seeing, Brian? Honestly, it really depends on the customer. And, you know, a lot of customers don't know what they want, right? They don't know that this is even a feature that's available to them. And you start talking about, you know, WGAN versus OSDP, and that's going to be, you know, way too wonky for a whole lot of the end users out there. Um, you know, some of my clients, I mean, the, the ones that have enterprise, I, you know, security departments, that's a Fortune 100 or a Fortune 500 company, they already know about this, they're already doing it. Um, and I, I suspect the reason they are doing it is probably first and foremost for the security features. But um, I think, you know, being able to centrally manage is, is, is got to be a huge selling point for them as well. Um, but going back to my original point, I mean, so many of the people that I work with, they, they haven't heard of this. So it's, it's going back to what we started at at the beginning and saying and laying out the features for them. And usually the one that, that perks their ears up the most is this sort of centralized management of readers and not having to call out, you know, um, for service calls if they want to do an upgrade or, or change something in the field. Uh, so how, how important is the supervision aspect? Um, people can, you know, management is I can do a firmware update to it. Supervision is, do, you know, is the reader dead? Or to, you know, Rick's point, do I know that the line got shorted? Um, are people looking for the supervision capability? You know, we talk about supervision being a physical security thing. Uh, do people look for that? Um, you know, I, I try asking the question, you know, if I ripped the reader off the wall on the outside of your building, would you know? How long would it take you to, you know, to learn? Uh, you know, do people actually try it? Are they using supervision? Is that a, a thing people care about? I think it will be something that they care about once they know that that feature is available to them. Um, yeah, I think someone made the example of you find out that it's not working on Saturday morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, there's probably a, a good bit of, um, you know, support for that in, in practice. So, well, there've been tamper wires in readers for years. Was anybody connecting them? In my experience, it's been pretty rare that some of the people actually hook up the tamper wires. I, I have, you know, certain projects where that was a requirement, but in general, it's, it's an unsupervised device. So, yeah, I think that's, that kind of covers it. Being able to push configuration information, um, things like that, being able to you know, change the LED colors, um, this sort of thing. Are you finding people are interested in that? Paul, are you finding people want to, want to be able to you know, manipulate the infrastructure that's out there? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, we just got a phone call uh, this week from uh, a government location asking about OSDP and can they use OSDP to modify when the threat levels change at the peripheral devices. And I didn't have an answer for them on that one yet. So, but right now, a lot of that's a physical change. It's not, you'd have to go out to a physical reader make a physical change. Um, and then going back to the, the thing that Brian was talking about before with regards to supervision, we've always have been asking, having people ask us about how do I supervise my card readers? And yeah, maybe there's a tamper, but the tamper doesn't tell you whether it's functioning or not, just tells you whether it's trying to be removed or not. So there's a couple of different things going on there. It's obviously the management part. When you've got thousands and thousands of readers, what we've seen historically is when an update is due, they just don't happen because they don't have the way, a way to go out and manually update thousands of readers at a time. So they wait. They just wait and that's okay, huh? Okay. Yeah, the... Uh, um... The point about the threat level, I've, I, I've seen that also. This is a, the strangest thing I get to do in the OSDP world is I build these little videos for people where I turn on every possible LED so they can see what it would look like. Uh, because for example, people with a skyscraper who want to have a, uh, they want to have a new threat level, they want to have something show on the LEDs so the people know to evacuate the building. So they want to go to some strange pattern, you know, it's red and green blinking back and forth with amber in the middle, some, some wonky pattern. And you can do those kinds of things with OSDP, with the readers. You can command it to do uh, relatively elaborate um, LED patterns and beepers also, if you really wanted to. Um, that might get annoying. Uh, so um, there's a windstorm here. Sorry, just heard a thump outside. Um, and, uh, and so they're being able to reconfigure the, the, you know, the perimeter so it can, can give people more information is really useful. Uh, 
And yes, if you had text output in your readers, you could, you could display threat levels also. Uh, you also, if you, another example of a new work item people are looking at, if we could do audio output to a reader, we could actually send a message, you know, intruder alert or something um, from Star Trek speed. See, we talk, we, we talk about the device management betterments, but I'm looking at the time here. Um, one more, come on user interface, you can let me hit the button, there we go. OSTP in the wild, so is, is it really out there? Um, so this is to, you know, are, are people seeing it ship? Are, are you seeing it specified? Is it, are people building, actually pouring concrete around OSDP readers? Not that that quite makes sense. What, what do you see, Brian? I, I'm seeing it out there for projects that, you know, we're specifying. And, and really this goes back to the session that you moderated, you know, two years ago, I think it was Rodney in, in Nashville. I mean, that was sort of the, the eye-opening uh, date in my mind of when I started thinking, oh shoot, I, this is this is no longer a question. This is something that we need to be doing. Um, but I, I know I remember asking the question when we were sort of preparing for this session of, I'd love to hear from a manufacturer of, of what percentage we're actually shipping of, of OSDP versus Wiegand. I, you know, going back to, you know, my start in, in the security business, you know, 15 years ago, back when we were transitioning from analog to IP cameras, you know, everyone used to love to throw up these, these adoption curves, right? Of, well, you know, back then it was 1% IP cameras and now it's probably, you know, 98 or whatever it is. Um, I'd love to see something similar for OSDP so we could, we could almost know how we're doing on industry awareness for this because it, 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 there doesn't seem to be really any, any downsides to it. Paul, what are you seeing? Well, I, I can only judge it by the number of devices that we sell that allow someone to install an OSDP reader and then have it connect to a Wiegand panel. And uh, that's currently about 20% of our business where it didn't exist three years ago. And this so, is a, a fair number of devices going out there. So it's not like, it's not like you're seeing three a month. <laughs> No, and, and, and it's good now because it's allowed us to develop other versions of it in different flavors and tastes and working with some OEMs on creating stuff specific to them. So yeah, there's certainly demand where people are taking the advice of the specifiers and the consultants on your perimeter first. So they're doing that and then realizing that they don't want to replace all their panels yet. So they just grab a simple device which converts that OSTP right back to Wigan at the panel. And therefore they're not um, vulnerable at the uh, ec the exit point or the uh, on the secure side of the door on the uh, I'm sorry the attack side of the door. Mm -hmm. I just wrote down an industry survey uh, project. Uh, hopefully, I could get Brian some some graphics to use. Yeah, that would be that would be good. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, wonders never cease. You still see procs out there, and you still see weekend out there, right? And um, you know, yes. I, I I'm, I'm glad for sessions like this to to help push industry awareness around these uh, these new technologies. I love being escorted into high security facilities to, to where they, you know, the, the senior manager badges in with their prox reader to let me in the building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happens way too much. Yes. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll, if I, if I can just quickly share a, a, a question that came through our help desk a couple of days ago, um, an end user called us, which is unusual, it's usually integrators. And their question to us was, I have three choices to make and I'm going to read them to you. The first one is, um, I have the option of using a clonable card with secure comms. I have the option of using secure card with open comms, or I have the option of using secure cards with secure comms, which should I choose? But they're asking us to make that decision, which is pretty scary. Right, so, so Brian, what's your answer? <laughs> um, I think I would err on the side of secure <laughs> in both cases. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, J Joe, is it what? What does the cybersecurity community at, at, at CIA recommend that we do? I mean, should we ask them? I mean, I, I'm not trying to taunt them. I'm saying that there's a bunch of uh, places inside the CIA world where asking these kinds of questions and figuring out how to give people reasonable answers is a, a topic we all work on. Yeah, for sure. I think that, that that's the, the entire security industry, right? I always err on the side of secure. So um, the 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 uh, I am the staff liaison to the cybersecurity advisory bo um, advisory board, and it's a topic that we all um, we talk about. How how can OSDP be um, uh, in this uh, this conversation? It, it it everything needs to be an IoT thing, and everything IoT needs to be secure. And OSDP yeah. is an IoT protocol. I guess my answer is I don't like to put steel doors on grass huts. Uh, and so I would buy the secure as possible option from you, Paul, 
And I would also turn around and use that with a device which has uh, secure as possible credentials, um, which usually doesn't mean procs, but you know, certain cases it's different. You know, a, a one-time mechanism used for visitor management that just uses a QR code, which is only valid for two minutes, you know, that's not insecure. Uh, so you got to be careful here, you know, with the blanket uh, technology equals not secure kind of question. So, so Rodney, we've got five minutes left here. A yep. question for the panel. You know, there are, are a number of manufacturers out there who say they support OSDP, may even be in their spec sheets, but they're not on Joe's list right now. And they may not even be in the pipeline at CIA for OSDP Verify. So what do you all think about those? Do you go on the manufacturer's reputation? Do you trust them? Do you hope it's going to work? Or do you really hold fast to the verify? What's, what, what's good practice? So my, my opinion is the good practice is you make sure you have enough information so you feel like you can, you can trust that it's going to work. And that might mean you trust your manufacturer. It might mean you get some external equipment to uh, actually you know, get it verified. You know, make sure somebody has a staging environment and actually try the stuff and, and prove it works. Um, it'd be, you know, it, you know, if, if, this, if we were all talking about network switches and I was in some random place with a vendor switch I'd never seen before, you know, we'd hook the thing up and make sure the smoke didn't come out. Uh, and then we'd run some network traces and make sure the, the traffic looked right uh, and make sure all the other equipment involved uh, and its good management capabilities all reported that things were healthy. Uh, so, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd use the tech to make sure the stuff worked um, and lean on the vendor to get to come up with a good answer and why they're not verified. Um, and, you know, and people might have very good answers. It's not like every, I'm not trying to be the fashion police here, uh, but they should have a good answer why they're not doing that. If they think they, if they think they followed the SIA spec, it's not like they don't know who SIA is. Joe, what, what are people telling you about why they're not going through the verified program? Is it because they can't meet the verified criteria? They don't want to spend the money. They don't want to be bothered. What are you hearing? It's just understanding the process. I think we, we've had a number of, of, of conversations with vendors and, uh, you know, you see, you see the price list on it. I think someone mentioned in the chat there's a, there's a price to it. Um, however, we, we price it very, uh, uh, very easily for someone, uh, for uh, different vendors that all run the same OSTP firmware to, um, to go through the process. And I think, I think once they understand that, they – it's something that they could sign on to. Uh, we don't have a, a structure where they um, have to uh, continue paying a, a annual fee. Um, they, when we change the spec, it doesn't automatically trigger a, um, a, 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 a retest. Uh, we, we've made this lightweight uh, so that these types of conversations that we're having here where there's confusion um, can be smoothed out as, as, as an industry. Um, uh, what, what we, so, so that, that's really, it, it's, I don't think people quite understand it yet, but I do think conversations like this where you can point to a list and, and, and folks are seeing benefits of being on this list, you'll start seeing those companies um, you know, uh, fall, fall into, into line because it is lightweight, it's simple for them, and it makes it simple for the consultants and suppliers. And Ronnie, so, I believe you told me the firmware is open source, correct? Yeah, there's, a, there's an open source implementation uh, so people can use that to validate against, and also engineering teams can use that to identify how they want to build the thing up. Um, the other thing about certifications is we're in the physical security business. They're supposed to have UL 290 something or other and all that. Um, all, my all my specifier friends know how to quote these numbers. Uh, so the idea of a vendor saying, oh, I'd have to pay for the certification. Well, didn't you have to pay for UL anyway? It's like the, they show up as like they have an allergy to the concept of paying for a certification, and they clearly should have been doing that already. So I find that a little curious. So yeah, I, I, I was, I was going to say, add real quick, I, I think it's going to be driven by the end users too, because that's what we're starting to see is they're starting to ask us as a manufacturer, when we say that we're OSDP compatible or OSDP certified or OSDP verified, you know, what we started a while back and, and someone on the panel with us today has been helping us along that is it's the trust and verify. I, I think it's important that as manufacturers, we always need to have a third party verify what we're doing to make sure that it is what it is. So Rodney, I'll let you wrap it up here, my friend. Yeah, we're out of, we're out of time here. Thank, thank you very much to the panelists and, and for the questions to come in um, and uh, uh, on to the next session at 2.15.